Have you ever wondered what sin is, what the consequences of sin are, and how to deal with sin in a way that is practical, yet effective and biblical? Join us as we discuss the answers to those questions based on Micah chapter 1, verse 9. Verse 9, her wound is incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people. So here's a very important statement from a prophet, right? When you and I continue to sin and we don't repent, it's going to get to a point where the effects, the consequence of that sin, it's like a wound that is incurable. You can keep putting Band-Aid on it, but it's not going to do you any good. Not only will it become incurable, but it will also come to Judah. So we're talking about from the northern kingdom spreading to the southern kingdom, Samaria, right, to Judah. That's how the effects and the consequences of sin can be. So there is no such thing as your sin only affects you. My sin affects everybody in my path even affects the locality, the geography where God has planted me, which is the next important message beginning from verse 10 to verse 15 with the mention of the names of his places that we're going to unpack when we get to that. So it says right here, it has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. The gate right here is a very important word. It's an important phrase. So during this time, the people will gather in front of the gate of the city. It's an idiomatic expression. It did not necessarily have to have a physical gate. What it's referring to is like a, a city hall, if you want to put it in a modern contemporary person. The elders, the priests, and uh, the people who are in charge of the community. This is where they gather. This is where they make decisions judicial, legal decision. We had an example of this in the book of Ruth, right? When Boaz went to the city gate, confronted the colonial money as it regards to who's going to end up getting Ruth, right? So right here is a good example. The main thought and application of this verse 9 is very simple. Before our sins have that far-reaching consequences, we should have the humility to repent. It's easier said than done, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> when pride gets in the way, when selfishness gets in the way, when self-righteousness gets in the way, every second we don't repent of our sin, that means one extra second for the consequences of that sin to have an impact on the people around us, on the locality where God has planted us. Hmm. Now, how did you pick up the repenting of sin in that? Well, it's very simple right here, incurable. The word incurable right here, right? Yep. Yeah, so, that, I got that as as uh, sin is a far as far reaching consequences. So if you cut yourself, let's say you like to cook, Stephen. So you're chopping meat and onion, and by mistake you cut yourself. And if you don't do anything, you're gonna bleed to death, right? Yeah. But then again, if you're gonna do something, you better do it right. You don't just put a band aid over it. You put other chemicals to make sure that their wound does not have any other thing, germs, bacteria, right? Yeah. Like, like we all are supposed to have this thing called tetanus shot. And the wisdom of that is if there is rust in a nail that you stepped on, that rust in that nail is going to travel through your bloodstreams, right? So this yeah. is the idea right here, incurable. And yep. when it comes to sin, what is very dangerous is the effects and the consequences of sin are discreet. 
I can see it. You, uh, I can see it. Been just a line for it has come to Judah. For the reason that even if it comes to Judah, it's come to the very center of you know uh, uh, of the temple, you know of the the spirit, right, or the heart right there. So that's where I guess I see it when yeah. it says for it has come to Judah. If it comes to Judah, it's come to the uh, the place of either or, or recognize it and repenting. I'd see that. Yeah, so if you take the word Judah and you replace it with what it means, which means praising God, and if you go back to the original, the opening verse of this book, remember the mention of the name Judah, the, the kings, the kings of Judah, right? So right there, the praise the king of Judah itself is very telling because you and I are created by God and intended by God to be royal kings, royal priests, people who have a royal position and authority and power that we can raise our hands at any given moment and time to praise God. And if you do not repent of your sin, the effects and consequences of your sin is going to rob you from praising God. Mm. <laughs> Very simple, right? Well, you tell me somebody who sinned and is happy-go-lucky. Hmm. No. <laughs> maybe for a few minutes maybe for a few when you commit that sin it feels good but when the consequences begin to impact you sooner or later sooner or later you're going to be crying right yeah and sin creeps up on you it, it can be so subtle and then you find and then one day you're just like how did I get here <laughs> You know, and, and, and it's not just me that are there. I drag so many other people with me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right? And and the consequences of the sins themselves can be, sometimes, can be very discreet. Right? Yeah. These are the kinds of things that, that are not being thought of, that are not being preached of in churches, right? We don't even hear sin being talked about anymore these days. It's a uh, it's a taboo, mm. so to speak, right? Mm. Yes, right. And and it's it ends right here. Notice from Northern Kingdom to Judah, Southern Kingdom. Notice right here to Jerusalem. We unpack the meaning of the word Jerusalem. You make a man to God and to people that you have sinned against, so that the foundation of peace will become something that you're going to build that relationship on in the future. So this is another effects of sins right here. It will rob you of peace. Frank? Well, I have uh, a question about incurable. So if we repent, isn't there a way to reverse that with time? So the idea with repentance is you are finding yourself going in the wrong direction. Then God sends somebody. God causes things to happen. God uses his Holy Spirit who lives in you to wake you up, so to speak, to open your eyes. So you have to exercise your will that God gives you to say, okay, if I continue on this path, it's nothing but destruction and death. So I got to exercise my will to make that turn once and for all, never to go back to that direction. The reality of our Christian life tells us differently. Especially if you are in a bondage. Am I right? Yes. Especially if you already fallen victim to a stronghold that you let in somehow, some way. We can flesh this out in any which way you guys want. Sex, drugs, alcohol, even relationship. Co-dependence relationship. I get from you what I need. You get from me what you need. That's co-dependence. And once we establish that, like I said before, we're not going to see it the way God sees it. We're not going to see it the way the Bible sees it. Until God sends somebody, causes things to happen, the breakup of the relationship, for example, so good a way to process this, then we realize, wait a minute, we're in the wrong path, right? And praying, it is in that moment, you have to say, no, I got to turn around. I don't want to go back to the same path. Stephen. So, Frank, as I shared last night, up until that point where, where 
where the Holy Spirit showed me that I have a, a tendency, a pattern of this bitterness and going in there, but I don't even, even recognize it. Up until that very point, I have to tell you, it was incurable because every time I went to that place, I was throwing boulders at my wife. I was throwing boulders at my wife. I was killing it. There was death and destruction in that thought. But because the Holy Spirit recognized that, uh, it was I was incurable until you know Mimi could have told me Mimi probably has told me that dozens and dozens of times in a relationship. Yeah, you go to this place, you know, based on that. But until the Holy Spirit really re revealed it to me, I, and that was a sickness. Now, so I have to think that because of that, my, a whole, there's a whole life change because of that. Yes. So what you're saying right there is simply this, right? Before it becomes a stronghold, it was a foothold. Before it became a foothold, it was a toehold. It is when Mimi was beginning initially to let you know, to make you aware, and you keep avoiding, you keep shunning, you keep shutting her down, that toehold becomes a foothold. The foothold turns into a stronghold. By then, it got you and got you good. Bill? No, I'm just, I'm a computer listener. Am I right? Hmm. I agree. I agree. It was life changing because, it, and like I said last night, it didn't convict me the way a typical sin would show me. It was like a release. It was almost there was a smile on my face. You know, I don't. You know, I don't want to lay it off as it wasn't, but it was. It was good. It was. It was revealing. Like it's like it shouldn't happen anymore. Kind of, I think, Frank. Chris. Well, the only way for it not to happen anymore is for you. I mean, when the Holy Spirit, Spirit revealed strongholds that I have in my life, it's beautiful and it hurts my heart that I have them. And and that's that's what the Holy Spirit does. He changes our heart. But then I have to fight it. You know, I have to I have to show up too. It's not just going to go away. And I have to, I have to back it up with scripture, and and fight it with scripture, and fight it with scripture, and fight it with scripture every time it rears its ugly head, and then it will eventually go away. But I have to put my 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 two cents in with it too. It's not just the Holy Spirit doing this thing. Yeah, so it's a partnership. A lot of Christians yeah. don't understand. Once you become a Christian, it's not a one-way street. It's not that God alone is finishing all the good work has begun in you. you got to take up the responsibility yourself. Well, I mean, recognizing your enemy is is, have, is, 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 is a win right there. And, and so I got to at least recognize that. Oh, good. You know, I think that's the, in, the curable part. Right. Um, just to, you know, to go along with, I guess what you guys are saying, especially with what Chris says, you know, it's like, you know, now that, you know, like in Stephen's case, now that he's recognized this or the spirit, the Holy Spirit has brought this his attention and, you know, and praise God that he's accepted it because now he's ready to do something about it. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, Psalm 19 and the second eight verses where it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? And what does it say? Meditate on your precepts. Regard your ways, delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. That's where we get our strength to continue on in the righteous ways. Because Chris is right. We, I mean, Stephen Dry and Chris is right. We can't do it ourselves. I mean, yeah, we have a part, but without God, there's no possible way we can do it. So the Bible in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, tells us if today you hear his voice, Pardon not your heart. But how many of us, when we are sinning, when we are actually committing that sin, and a still small voice of the Holy Spirit whispers that first into our ears, we ignore it, we pretend he didn't speak to us, that's the first mistake. Secondly, in a throw of sin that we're committing, somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit will come back because that's his job. His job is to convict us of our sin. And he'll bring stuff to our remembrance, right? So this is why Paul said, for our weapons are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty to the pulling down, pulling down of the stronghold, right? So what is Paul saying right here? Simply this, if you allow a thought in your mind, an unholy thought, and you feed on it, 
stay in and stay out. Every chance you get. That thought becomes a stronghold. You look at that thought as a piece of brick. Anytime you add thought, energy, and time into it, you basically are adding another brick on top of that brick that eventually, by the time it's all over, without you realizing it, you've built a stronghold, a wall. By then, you become a prisoner beyond <clears throat> that wall. Yep. Yeah. You can't stop thinking about it at one point until, yes. you, until you have to act on it. So Paul is giving us the solution. He said, if you're thinking of unholy thinking, you need to know what word in the Bible, you need to replace that thought with. It comes from Philippians. Paul said, if there's anything good, if there's anything kind, if there's anything holy, if there's anything in harmony, think of these things. Mm. Mm. Right? So you don't just shove it aside. You don't just put it under the carpet. You, you could literally speak it out. I see what's going on in my head. I'm thinking lustful thoughts. But the Bible said, I should not be thinking about that. I should replace those lustful thoughts with holy thoughts, pulling down stronghold, bringing into captive every stronghold to the obedience of Christ. Is it easy to do that? It takes practice. <laughs> You know, what really hits me here is the next line after what you just read. I don't think you you, you read even to Jerusalem, right? Just so, got I mean, to it. Yeah, so, we're unpacking that, yeah. So, but anyway, I didn't know if you read that. I know we were talking about the gate and stuff, but I don't. I didn't know if you read that part. But either way, uh, when you relate it to even to the foundation of our peace, that is major, right? It is. It you is. know, I mean, I mean, it's like that's that's what our sin does to us. It takes away our peace, right? Sure. And that's kind of yeah. what we're talking about here, you know? Now, I don't know if you see right here the wisdom of God through this prophet in this phrase, the gate of my people. This is the first defense God gives you and I, the gate of my people. The brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, a Bible study, a prayer group. Those are the gates. Yeah. Notice, notice what we do when we have sin against other. Let's just say that somebody here sins against somebody else in this Bible study group. You know what that person would do? They would leave the Bible study. Am I mm -hmm. right? Or justify it. Okay. I'm so, not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so the gate, the gate of my people that God intends it to be the defense is already broken down. Mm. <laughs> but it isn't a lot of time when we sin, we don't we don't really realize that we're sinning. We're just caught up in that moment of doing wrong and, and we push we push God and good aside. So it's it's like even if we did sin against someone in this group, we, we probably wouldn't even realize it and just keep going on. And if you do that, um, not willingly, not intentionally, God is going to do his part. He's going to somehow, someone make you aware, right? Yeah. But we need to discipline ourselves to understand. The word sin is very simple. It's an archery term. So God has a target. And when you sin, you're missing that target. And God is simply telling, it's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. I expect you to miss that. But don't walk away. Keep coming back. Keep hitting that target. Keep trying to hit that target until you become skillful enough. That's good. So, right? so, so part of our prayer should be, God, please give me the awareness to, to, to see what I'm doing and and to make those changes, right? Exactly. We have a good example by Paul in Ephesians. He said, pray that God open the eyes of their understanding. Later on, he said, we are to pray with understanding. Yeah, I, I pray for my unknown sins. Mm. Reveal my sure. unknown sins to me. Um, we should. 
That's just a million of them during the day, I'll tell you, you know? <laughs> well, I'm, you know, sometimes when I pray and I do those flashcards of my day and I'm like, I am such a wretched man, you know? I, it, there's a ton of things that we just fall short of. Now, we owe it to the Catholic Church for this terminology. We got two kinds of sins we're talking about right here. Commissions of sins and the sins of omission. The commissioning of the sin, the actual committing of the sin, and the omission, the sins, that, the things that we're supposed to do that we don't do, love our neighbor, helping the poor, visiting the sick, praying for the sick. Look, the, the Ten Commandments is very clear, folks. Do this, don't do that. If we focus only on don't do that, we're missing out on the doing this. Let's go. Okay. Great point. I mean, how, how can awareness of missing the mark that God has for us is the beginning of the step? And we need to continually disciplining ourselves to think, to process it in our head. This is a discipline. It's not going to happen overnight. Right? But God is a redeeming God. That's why I always said, God is not going to take you out of an environment, of a situation, away from your Goliath, away from, away from your Pharaoh. No, no. He's going to bring you right back to that environment. He's going to bring you right back to face your Pharaoh. Because his intent is for you to defeat that Pharaoh. So, Steve, you have another bedroom to I read. Know, <laughs> he will. He will. That's good, man. That's funny, but that's all right. Praise to God for that. That's good. Now, I'm not surprised, guys, just so you know. No, not this. There's a beautiful narrative given to us about God's calling to Moses. Notice how Moses in the beginning already said to God, ah, you got the wrong guy. I can't even talk. Then sarcastically, God told him, who gave you your mouth? Yeah. He still argued with God. So God said, okay, I'll tell you what, Mo, I'm going to bring your brother along. Right? So God brought Aaron, his brother, alongside him. God is always creatively trying to help you and I to overcome our sin. It's just that we don't see it the way God sees it. Because we've been conditioned in our head into believing this God who is quick to punish us. By now, every one of us should have got it right. Look at David. Despite his murder, despite his adultery, he is a man after God's own heart. Now, if David was the only one that ever committed murder and adultery, this is a different story. David was not the only one that had committed murder and adultery. For that reason, his murder and his adultery were not a big deal to God. But we make it a big deal ourselves. Mm. I'm not saying that we should not make it a big deal. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is, First, we have to have this awareness of our tendency to miss God's mark. Secondly, when we're missing God's mark, we need to discipline ourselves to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, to see the work of God's hands in our life, sending somebody to confront us, making things happen in our life that make us wonder, how come whatever I touch go wrong, for example? Right? Those are the kinds of things that God is doing behind the scene, trying to get our attention. Hey, Paul. Hey, Stephen. Hey, whatever, right? You, you're, in a, you're in a bad spot right here. Yeah. Uh, trying to get your attention. Right? <laughs> you're, you're devolving again, Stephen. You're devolving. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifetime process. But the good news is, with each and every time we obey, with each and every time we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, it's going to get easier. 
before it hits you, you're going to see it coming off the corner of your eyes. Mm -hmm. Right? Is, is, this, is this making sense so far? First night. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. So, I hope this episode has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider subscribing to the channel? Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next episode of Beyond the Literal.